So this morning we are in Ezra, first of all. So if you have your Bible, I'd like to look at three different texts, all of which have to do with Artaxerxes, at least as a backdrop to what's going on. So the first of these is, this, is the book of Ezra. Ezra is right after 2 Chronicles, not a real long book, but if you find 2 Chronicles, you'll find it just after that. Ezra, of course, gives us the history of the restoration of God's people to the land. He actually goes back and does a retrospective, beginning with Cyrus, the first Persian ruler, and works his way through the adventures of the people of God in Israel up to the time of Artaxerxes, which is the time of Ezra himself. And so he picks up really his own story now in chapter 7 of the book of Ezra, and we'll take this beginning at verse 1 of chapter 7 and skip around just a little bit, but here we are, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 1, book of Ezra, word of God. After this, in the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah, blah, 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 all long protocol, genealogy, very impressive, goes all the way back to Aaron. Now drop down to verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon. He was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. For the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And then Ezra begins to describe his own preparations. What had happened was he knew that good things were happening in Jerusalem, but he also knew that the way in which worship was being conducted could be improved. The temple was in operation, but some of the particulars of the way they were engaging in this worship process needed a little bit of tweaking, you might say, and so Ezra felt that he was the man called to go and help them out. He asked Artaxerxes for authority to return, and apparently Artaxerxes also offered him an armed guard to travel with him and keep him safe on the roads. And this is his explanation of that. It's in verse 21 of chapter 8, short paragraph, Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might deny ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and cavalry to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king that the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And so Ezra makes the safe journey without any kind of imperial protection along the way, and I want to return to that a little bit later and a few thoughts about it. Now if you'll flip over a few pages to the book of Nehemiah, which is in this Bible just about four or five pages ahead. Nehemiah is about 15 years later. Ezra goes to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Nehemiah now is in the 20th year. So Ezra's already been there for a while. Nehemiah, as I said, was a cupbearer, a very prestigious post to the king, and he hears of what's happening in Jerusalem, and most of it is good news, but he also hears that there's still these broken down walls, burned with fire, going clear back to the days of the Babylonians, and he feels heart sick that his hometown still has these ruins that have not been rehabilitated. And so again, Nehemiah feels that God is fingering him for this task, and we have the story of how that plays out beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, Nehemiah. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was served to him, I carried the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. So the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? This can only be sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, may the king live forever, why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my ancestors' graves, lies waste and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, 
what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my ancestors' graves, so that it may be rebuilt. The king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a date then I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may grant me passage until I arrive in Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, directing him to give me timber, to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the gracious hand of my God was upon me. All right, now the last text I'd like to look at with you this morning as backdrop for our discussion is the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Malachi is prophesying to the people of God in Jerusalem around the year 430. 430 is still under the reign of Artaxerxes, so Malachi is the one prophet whose career takes place under the reign of this king. And... It's a short book. It's notable because it is, of course, the last prophetic message to God's people before this protracted silent period, as it's called, where there's no prophets to Israel for over 400 years. In fact, who is the next prophet that comes to the people of God after Malachi uh, ends his prophetic message? The next prophet is John the Baptist. Excellent. A plus. You're doing great. So anyway, and in fact, Malachi predicts, as you know, the coming of John the Baptist. Chapter 3 of Malachi, verse 1. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Now drop down, if you have your Bible there, to verse 8. Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that they may, there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locusts for you so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will count you happy for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And then one more little text, the very last chapter of Malachi. Look, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will not leave them either root or branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Teaching, or remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Lo, I send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. It's always been a bit of an awkward problem in the Jewish religion that the last word of their sacred scriptures is the word curse. 
But from a New Testament point of view, we take great delight in that because we know that the one who came as the messenger of the covenant came to redeem us from the curse of the law. And in some ways, that great theme had to hang out there for 400 years to enrich their appreciation of the one who became a curse for us, as Paul tells us in Galatians chapters 3 and 4. So let's uh, have a word of prayer, and we'll get underway. Heavenly Father, we are deeply grateful for the mercies that you pour out upon us. We thank you for blessing us so richly with a beautiful place to worship together, for brothers and sisters in Christ whose fellowship we so much appreciate, for your word which illumines our path, for great stories which engage our minds and inspire our hearts, and for all of this we give you thanks and ask your blessing now upon us as we proceed into this study, asking all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, friends, pop quiz. (laughs) The first king of Persia who authorized the people of God to return to the land of Israel and start building the temple was Cyrus. Second question for 50,000. No, I'm just... (laughs) Who is the son of Cyrus, who wasn't such a good guy and who was somewhat hostile to the Jewish people and spent most of his career in Egypt and died probably by suicide on his way back because there was a coup back in Persia. His name is? Cambyses. I kind of heard it out there. Cambyses. Never mentioned by name in the Old Testament. Rather brief reign and not a guy that we have all that much respect for in terms of his uh, general character, but nevertheless we touched on him. Then there's a very short reign of a guy who holds himself out as the deceased, well, he holds himself out as the brother of Cambyses, who happened to be deceased, you know. And so he's called, anybody remember this weird name? Pseudo Smyrtus. Pseudo Smyrtus. There you are. The most fun name of all. And then, of course, we get the next one who is heroic. He is the one who authorizes the completion of the building of the temple. He also fights the first Persian war in the year 490, and his name is. Darius the Great reigns down to 486, and he's followed by the man who is at least apparently the husband of Esther, fights the second Persian war, defeated in it in the year 480, and his name is Xerxes. Xerxes. Very good. You're all doing great. You did not flunk Sunday school, and that is a good thing. You get to come back. back. That's right, for advanced studies. All right, well, the next guy we have then, as I say, is Artaxerxes. He reigns for about 30 years from 465 to 424. He did reach the throne in a somewhat dubious manner. We're not quite sure how it happened, but the best evidence is there were a couple of well-placed knives in a couple of select backs, and as a result of that, somehow he reached the throne. But besides that, he's generally regarded as a pretty competent ruler, and he certainly, at least in terms of the longevity of his rule, seems to have been fairly capable. He inherited an expansive empire. We've looked at this map or something like it before. The Persian world includes both the kind of brownish color and also the yellow at the edges there. So it goes all the way over to the borders of India in the east. It reaches down and covers Egypt to the southwest and also has a little toehold in Europe up to the northwest. So it's a very large, in fact, the largest empire to date in the history of the world. It was only exceeded really by Rome, which would come some years later. Artaxerxes, as was often the case, had to deal with a revolt. This was often an opportunity for subservient nations to you know, try to wiggle out from under imperial control, and in this case, Egypt attempted to do so. They had been occupied, as you recall, under Cambyses, and Cambyses didn't win any points with them when he slew the Apis bull. You remember that story we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And the the Egyptians have been waiting for an opportunity to try to get out from under these Persians and their imperial presence. And so in in 461, just a couple or three years or so into his reign, the Egyptians are in a state of revolt, which wouldn't have been a big problem, except that they were supported by an unlikely ally known as the Delian League. Now, if you know ancient history, you know the Delian League was a formulation of cities of Greece 
that bonded together, even though they'd had a history of being at war with each other all the time, they more or less united against a common enemy known as the Persians. They'd fought the First and Second Persian Wars successfully, but they were fearful that the Persians were going to come by, back for a third bite at the apple, you know. And so they figured that they'd lay down their squabbles with each other and unite in facing this perceived common foe, the Persians, and that became the basis for this so-called Delian League. It was called Delian League because its original capital was the little island of Delos. But soon thereafter, the capital shifted to Athens. And Athens became, therefore, more or less the chairman of the board. And all of the dues, therefore, for the Delian League flew, uh, sort of flowed in to Athens. And it gave Athens huge amounts of revenue, which created the financing for what's sometimes called the Greek Golden Age. It should be the Athenian Golden Age. That's when Pericles was ruling, the Parthenon was built, and so on. They developed quite a respectable military force, and they didn't like the Persians. And when they found out the Egyptians were revolting against the Persians, they say, hey, let's get in on the fun, you know. So they send a fleet, a pretty good-sized uh, military force down to support the Egyptians in their rebellion, and that made the whole fight somewhat more formidable from the Persian point of view. The Persians didn't respond directly, or immediately, I should say. The Artaxerxes himself kind of was biding his time a little bit, knowing that this was going to be more than your average difficult struggle, and so he doesn't respond immediately. What does happen is in 458, he sends Ezra to Jerusalem. Now, Ezra, as you know, attributes the positive response from Artaxerxes to the hand of God being upon him, and rightly so. But Ezra is also doing something that will serve Artaxerxes' purposes politically. And this has been observed many times, that Artaxerxes, whatever his interest was in Jerusalem, from a religious point of view, had a deep interest in Jerusalem politically. Because you'll notice that Jerusalem is going to be right on the path that Artaxerxes will have to take when he goes and, and tries to win back Egypt. And it's always nice to have friends along the way. When you're going into battle, you don't want to have to fight a battle to get to the battlefield. And so he wants to have those more or less uh, positively disposed to him en route. And of course, he knows that if he does good things for Ezra and for the people of, of uh, Jerusalem, that they will then provide some logistical support for him. They'll sort of you know, help them out and so that they can hit the battlefield fresh rather than having been through miles and miles of uh, hard uh, you know, travel and so on. So anyway, there's, there's probably a political explanation for Artaxerxes helping Ezra, aside from the providential care that was evident there from Ezra's own uh, presentation of it. Ezra re uh, arrived in Jerusalem in uh, 458, and over the next year or so, he does do a fair amount of sort of raising the bar, you might say, with respect to how worship is conducted in the city. It seems that everything was going all right, but there were certainly some little kind of loose ends that were not being observed as appropriately as they should have been, and Ezra comes in as more or less an expert to improve the practice of the people there, and he gives some de uh, details of that in the book of Ezra itself. All right, in 454, some 10 years, after Artaxerxes becomes king, he does launch his campaign. He does follow that very track, and he does, in fact, successfully resist and put down the revolt which took place in Egypt, and so he recovers and retains control of Egypt, but it was a tough fight, and especially those vicious Greeks who were such ferocious warriors did give him more of a struggle than he would have otherwise had. And Artaxerxes took notes on what had gone, you know, he knew, of course, their recent history in the Persian Wars and the losses there, and he felt pretty good to get away with his skin after this conflict in Egypt. And so, anyway, that was, uh, that was successful on the Persian part. However, it's interesting, this is the last time that the Persians ever actually go into a battlefield conflict directly until over a hundred years later when they meet another Greek whose name is 
Alexander the Great. And of course, on that occasion, they don't come out so well. What happened on this uh, occasion is that after they had retained Egypt, the head of the Delian League, a man named Kimon, decided that the Persians were vulnerable enough that this might be a chance to actually strike a blow right to the heart of the Persian world. This was like a little hors d'oeuvre for Alexander the Great. You know, Kimon didn't have quite the tactical skill of Alexander, but he's going to take a run at it. And so he actually takes about 200 triremes and goes and seizes the island of Cyprus, which really gives him pretty immediate access to the heart of the Persian Empire. Artaxerxes was deeply concerned about this. He felt about the way we Americans felt, some of you in the room are old enough to remember this, when the Soviet Union was putting nukes on the little island of Cuba. You remember Cuba, that was the way you pronounced it back then. And that put JFK on a very, in a very interesting pickle, you know. He was a new president, young guy, and was he going to have the verve to stand up to this Nikita Khrushchev guy who was pretty scary? I was only 10 years old at the time, and he was really scary, you know, from my point of view back then. Some of you remember this, don't you? And we were worried about having missiles that close to our coast, and it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was like the Cyprus Missile Crisis for the Persians. Here you've got these Greeks who are pretty formidable warriors, and they are there just threatening the very heartland of the Persian world. And Artaxerxes is wondering what to do. If I go to these, hit these guys toe to toe, I'm not sure who's going to win. You see, he was smart enough to know that it was not a completely predictable outcome. And so what he does instead is opt for diplomacy. Sends a couple of emails to Kimon says, hey man, hey buddy, you know, how's about we make a deal? And so they negotiate a deal that came to be called the Peace of Callias. And this is in 449, based on the little town where they met together and negotiated this. And essentially what they did was split the Mediterranean world right down the middle. This is quite a tribute to the Greeks that the Persians were nervous enough about going a third time against them that they'd rather give them quite a bit of land in order to strike a deal with them than meet them on the field of battle. At least Artaxerxes seemed to view it that way. So this black line you see on the map essentially represents the dividing line. And what happened here was the Greek Isles and Asia Minor, which had once been owned by the Greeks, and they called it Ionia. All of it was given back. And the Greeks once again took possession of it. The territory to the right of the line, to the east, was continued to be part of Persian holdings. Egypt remained part of Persian holdings. But nevertheless, it does represent a real shift in the balance of power in the ancient world. And what we see is, of course, Greece is rising now on the radar screen. And eventually, of course, this will culminate in the Uh, career of Alexander the Great. So this is what's happening. So we have Greece and Persia more or less representing the two superpowers of the ancient world by the middle of the 5th century BC. In 445, just four years later, Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem. Nehemiah, of course, is going, as we saw in the text we read, because the city of Jerusalem continues to need some tender loving care. Ezra is there providing for its spiritual well-being, but the political well-being of the city is is more or less uh, up for grabs, and so Nehemiah comes to be the governor and to oversee really rebuilding the city, and especially the walls and the gates and so on. And so that takes place just in that time frame, and that uh, shows his trip back. He rebuilds the walls. It only takes about a year, and uh, I was there at the time. Snap that with my digital camera, and uh, so that's exactly what it looked like. Nehemiah, 12 years later, returns to Persia. He was there for 12 full years, and of course his role was not simply a contractor, he was there as a governor, and so he details for us in the book of Nehemiah some of his concerns and care for the people of God and some of the reforms that he implemented, which are all well worth our reading. Returns in 432, 
And it's only two years later, in about the year 430, in the absence of Nehemiah and after the death of Ezra, that we have Malachi. You may not know he's the only Italian. Malachi, he was Malachi, he was the uh, Italian prophet. My kids think that's pretty funny, you know. You are, you're way too sophisticated for that kind of rude humor, so I'll just uh, leave it at that. But anyway, Malachi is the prophet who comes, and he's not real happy with circumstances even then. And you may, if you're familiar with the book of Malachi, know that he critiques the people, especially at two points. One, that now that Ezra's out of the picture and now that Nehemiah's gone, they are once again allowing a little bit of slippage in the quality of their worship. And they're not bringing sacrificial animals and offerings and so on that really are up to par, really reflective of a heart of true reverential worship for God. And Malachi goes so far as to say that they are robbing God. Very strong language. And he says to them that if they will put God to the test, if they will honor him with their tithes and their offerings, if they will really obey him in these expressions of their devotion to God, God will respond by opening the very windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing. And that, of course, becomes one of the great texts in the Old Testament, encouraging all of us to be generous as we support God's work in this world. And Malachi is really the Old Testament classic text to argue for that. The other point where he criticizes them more is at the point of their moral performance, a lot of marriage and divorce going on, a lot of kind of uh, less than honorable practices along those lines. The other theme, however, in Malachi that we noted is that he is the last prophetic voice and he gives them this wonderful prediction that a time is coming when the so-called messenger of the covenant, who we know of as Christ himself, is going to come as the great final uh, consummate expression of God's covenantal guarantees to the people of God. The people of Israel in the Old Testament are unique in many respects, one of which is that they were one of those people that was always looking forward to their golden age rather than back on their golden age. They were a forward-looking people. And Malachi, in a sense, stands for the last great expression of that prospective anticipation of the people of God for a time when God would finally pour out this ultimate messianic blessing on them, giving them fair warning of it by, of course, sending one in the spirit and power of Elijah, who we know of as John the Baptist, who would prepare the way. And so that's the uh, contribution that's made by Malachi. I want to just uh, skip through quickly what really happens through the rest of the rulers of Persia. It's another about 100 years or so, and just in the spirit of Kind of mopping up, we're going to treat this briefly and then come back for a few more thoughts about Malachi. Uh, this is the tomb of Artaxerxes I. If you're ever swinging through Iran, you can drop by and take a look at that. That's basically what it looks like. The next king is a guy named Xerxes II. He rules, count them, for one year. He actually only rules for 45 days. He was the uh, son of uh, Artaxerxes. Uh, he was assassinated while drunk by his loving brother, Sogianus. Sogianus, this is when things start kind of melting down a little bit. You know the, the telltale sign. Sogianus rules for one year. He's assassinated by a kind of kingmaker in the ancient world named Ar, uh, Arbarios. He's a military commander. He has no interest in being the king, but he does like to create kings. And so he puts in place then a guy named Darius II, who is pretty good. So Darius II rules, as you can see, for about 20 years. He's the son of Xerxes II. He does restore some stability to the Persian world. This is when the Peloponnesian Wars are taking place. You know that the 5th century BC for the Greeks was a warring time. They had the Persian Wars at the beginning, they had the Peloponnesian Wars at the end. In the beginning, they united to, to defeat the greatest power in the world, the Persians. At the end of the story, they just tear themselves apart in civil conflict. And the great philosophical divide between Sparta with their more Dorian background and the Athenians with their more Mycenaean background finally comes to a head. And this awful time of bloodshed and really not much in the way of progress either way takes place. And it's during that time that Darius is ruling 
And he sees this as an opportunity to kind of capitalize on the vulnerability of the Greeks. He likes this Civil War stuff, you know. He thinks this is an opportunity for the Persians to sort of come back and begin reasserting themselves. And so he sent his son, a guy named Cyrus the Younger, which distinguishes him from Cyrus the Great, sent him to reestablish a Persian, Persian presence in the city which had been the capital city of the Persians there in Asia Minor, Sardis. And so Cyrus comes back. He doesn't come with great military show. He doesn't come as if he's trying to conquer anybody. But he does reestablish a kind of Persian beachhead there in Asia Minor at the city of Sardis. Cyrus the Younger was a fairly astute guy himself and realized that if he could sort of predict who the winner would be in this Peloponnesian conflict and help out the presumptive winner, then he would be creating some allies in the Greek world. And so that's exactly what he does. And so Cyrus, the younger here, supports the Spartans. And you may know the Spartans ultimately won. It was kind of a Pyrrhic victory. They won, but at great cost to themselves. And what they won wasn't really worth the effort, as it all turned out. But they did win, and they won in part because the Persians gave them considerable assistance. Now Cyrus was probably hedging his bets a little bit here. He probably had in mind an ultimate game plan that may not have been apparent to anyone else at the time. But in any event, the Peloponnesian War is fought and ends. The next ruler that comes along is Artaxerxes II. This is just right at the end of the Peloponnesian War, 404. And Artaxerxes is the son to Darius, who was the predecessor, and the brother to Cyrus the Younger. Cyrus the Younger didn't like this. He thought he should have been the ruler. And so he cashes in on his um, credit with the Spartans and says, hey guys, how about coming on a little military campaign with me? I'll pay you, you'll be mercenaries, you're the most ferocious fighters in the ancient world, and I just have this little military expedition I'd like to take you on. He doesn't tell them he's going to be attacking his brother, the king of the Persian Empire, you know. And so these Spartans are all dressed up with nowhere to go. They've just won the Peloponnesian War, and so they say, okay, fine, you know, sounds good to us. And so off they go, and Cyrus actually then attacks with these Spartan mercenaries, the very heart of the Persian world, and this is in 401. Cyrus the Younger is killed at the Battle of Canusa. The commander of the Spartans was a guy named Xenophon, who you may have heard of. Xenophon is the commander of these 10,000 Spartans, and all of a sudden he's got a problem. He's got a military campaign on his hand with nothing to gain anymore because the guy who's hired them is dead. And so Xenophon is put to the task of trying to back the Persians out from the belly of the lion here. Or what, what's the term? The belly of the beast. Thank you. Yeah, well, and uh, without, you know, with as little uh, bloodshed and loss of life as possible. And so he brilliantly maneuvers a great retreat. And this is called the March of the 10,000. It's a classic piece of literature. And if you ever come across it, you should read it just for pure fun. You know, it, it's really, it's right, written at about this time. And Xenophon's our guy. So anyway, that's, uh, that's really the end of the interesting parts of Persian history. The next guy is Artaxerxes III. I have precisely nothing to tell you about him. The next guy is Artaxerxes IV. I have nothing to tell you about him. The next guy is Darius III. It's, it's winding down. Darius III is the last ruler of the Persians. He probably would have been a pretty decent ruler, but it just so happens that he came to the throne just as this young man known as Alexander the Great inherited the Macedonian world and through that the Greek world and launches his campaign. And of course, the long and short of it is that Alexander defeated the Persians and the rest is history. So we'll pick up that next time. What I'd like to uh, do in the spirit of our Sunday school lesson this morning is think a little bit about Ezra and the comment that he made. He was ashamed 
to ask Artaxerxes for armed support because he had bragged to Artaxerxes about how powerful the God of Israel is and Ezra all of a sudden realized he's kind of painted himself in a corner here. God can take care of us. Oh, by the way, would you mind sending us, you know, a couple of hundred troops to protect us along the way? He felt the mixed message there wasn't worthy of the claims he was making. So what to do? And he declines what apparently was available to him, armed support. And the question that occurs to me is how close was that to what we sometimes call putting God to the test? You realize there's a lot of examples of this kind of thing in the Old Testament. Maybe the two extremes that we could think of would be, on the one hand, Ahaz, who you may recall, this is from some weeks back, was told by Isaiah, in a sense, to you know, ask for a sign, anything he wanted, to prove that God would help him, God, God would protect him. Isaiah says to Ahaz, Ask a sign in heaven, on earth, whatever you want. It's almost like the you've got three wishes kind of situation. Just ask for a sign. What do you want? And, of course, Ahaz responds, sounding very godly. Oh, oh, far be it from me. I would never put God to the test. You see, oh, thank you, Ahaz. It's lovely. At the same time, we know that off to the side, he's cutting deals with the devil. He's making an alliance with Tiglath-Pileser, the king of the Assyrians, because he has more confidence in an Assyrian king than he does in the God of heaven and earth. So while he has this pretentious piousness, oh, I'd never put God to the test, he at the same time is double-crossing his faith in the God of Israel and everything else besides to make this deal with Tiglath-Pileser. There's one extreme. The other extreme comes to mind. When's another example? Uh, maybe the most famous example of all, where the, the statement, thou shalt not put thy, the Lord thy God to the test, pops up. Where is that? Jesus on the temple, on the temple mount, or on the temple pinnacle there, you know. The devil says to him, hey, you're the Messiah. I mean, what can happen to you? God's going to dispatch angels galore to make sure you don't even stub your toe. That's how protected you are. Why don't you show your faith in God? Why don't you show your great confidence in God? Just, you know, jump off this temple. People will see, be, it'll be a spectacle to behold. And Jesus says the same thing Ahaz said. Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Notice that when Ahaz says it, it's betraying an absolute lack of confidence in God. When Jesus says it, it's, it's demonstrating an absolute heartfelt trust and confidence in God. You know, they both say the same thing, don't they? The rule in the scriptures, and this is point one of my Sunday school lesson this morning, is we should not put God to the test. We should never paint ourselves into awkward corners where we are, in a sense, presuming on God's mercies, rather than making use of the ordinary means that he may have provided us for our good in the, you know, vagaries and vicissitudes of life. So those are the two. Those are kind of the bookends. Then you've got a couple of sort of compromised positions in the middle here. You've got Hezekiah and Ezra. If you remember Hezekiah, Hezekiah was facing the attack by Sennacherib. And Isaiah was saying to, to Hezekiah, God is going to protect you, God will care for you. And Hezekiah said, thank you, I believe that. And then Hezekiah built a tunnel, remember that? So that in the, in the event of a siege, he'd have a, a, a predictable water supply. If we translate that into modern terms, we'd say, Hezekiah trusted God, but he bought insurance. And Hezekiah is not condemned for that. Nobody came along and said, Hezekiah, you didn't trust God. What's this tunnel you're building here? Don't you know God will provide? No. Hezekiah did a good thing. He bought insurance. And there does seem to be biblically an idea that though we trust God, it's okay to use the ordinary means. So how come Ezra didn't use the ordinary means? 
They were available to him. He had armed forces that were prepared to go along. Artaxerxes wouldn't have batted an eye. This would be the ordinary course of events to provide. I mean, traveling out in the open there, even in the Persian world, could be somewhat risky. Here, Ezra, Ezra's not a warrior. He doesn't have, he has family, he has possessions, stuff. He's, a, he's in no position to defend himself against a brigand along the way. Why didn't he invoke the ordinary means? Why didn't he buy insurance? I was so flummoxed by this question, I asked my wife. <laughs> That's when you know your Sunday school teacher's desperate. You know. And she said, what? What'd you say, sweetheart? Beats me, I don't know, so I got no help there. So, here's the only difference I can find. Because I, I don't think Ezra would have been in the wrong, in the ordinary course of events, to have used, except that he'd said, he'd sort of put the reputation of God on the line, and that's what he was feeling at the point of his conscience. He didn't want to compromise this great testimony that he'd given to the king by then asking for support. But the thing that I notice in the, in the text here is that Ezra fasted and prayed, you know. And so my second Sunday school lesson is, hey, sometimes, in fact, I think ordinarily, we should use means. That's why God has provided them. But no matter what the decision, no matter what the circumstance, never neglect seeking the face of God. Joshua got himself in a lot of trouble, you recall. He'd beaten Jericho, the big mega city, and he thought, oh, AI's no big deal. And he didn't bother to seek the face of God, and he went and got his tail whipped by AI after he defeated Jericho. What was the problem? Didn't seek God's counsel. So whatever the decision is, large or small, whether you're tempting God or not, you know, the thing that we need to do is come before God and seek his wisdom. God is happy to give us wisdom. James commands us right off the bat in James chapter 1, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who will not mock you for your request, and gives liberally. So here's two examples. One guy kind of goes one way, one goes the other, and the only difference, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm certainly happy to hear, you know, maybe I'm missing something here, but at least it seems to me one apparent difference as they both sought the face of God was that God gave counsel to them one to do one thing, one to do another. Third point, Malachi. Malachi, of course, is giving the people of God a bit of a rough review because they are robbing God, as he says. And the one and only time in all the Bible when we are actually authorized to put God to the test is, of course, the authority we're given based on the book of Malachi, where he says, put God to the test and see if he won't open the windows of heaven. There is a deep sense in which God is a giving God, and he wants us to be those who reflect that deep character that he has by being giving people. And to be honest, I'm speaking very personally, and I hope I'm kind of ringing a bell in all of our minds here, that's hard to do. Sometimes it's very hard to really trust God at the point of giving giving time, we're jealous of our time, our treasure, our money, whatever it might be. It's very easy to get fixated on what we have in the bank rather, and, and, and what we're getting rather than what we have the opportunity to give. And God says, put me to the test. Test me and see if as you give, I will not pour out the very abundance of heaven, showering you with vastly more than you could have ever given to me. Because he wants that, it's not that God needs what we give, but he wants us to learn something of him by being people that reflect his character in that way. So Malachi gives us the one exception to the rule. Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God, except at this point. Test God all you want. Test him at the point of your generous support of what God's doing in this world. This church, Christian you know, ministries, legitimate places where your money can go to the help of lifting up the name of Christ and serving others. It's a wonderful opportunity to put God to the test.